it's a pleasure for me to, to be here and present some of the work we have been done in the Azores. Uh, most of the work that I'm, gonna to, I'm going to present is uh, some research that I've done for my PhD, for doctorado, and um, which led later to, the, to this project, Patel Rim, that we developed together with Pablo. And um, so I'm presenting an overview of all the work that, that we have been doing with Patella. Okay, in the Azores, we have two species of limpets, lapas. We have one which is called Patella aspera, and in Portuguese, we call it lapa brava. And the other one is Patella candii, which we call, we call lapa mansa. Uh, they are very easily distinguished by both the shell and if you turn them around, you can see the color of the foot, which is very different. So they are very easily identified. Also, Patella candii usually is a, is a species that occurs intertidally, mostly, whereas Patella aspera occurs both intertidally, but also subtidally, so underwater, okay? Uh, limpets are a very important species in the ecosystem because they regulate the, the amount of algae that grows and occupies space. So they, they have this radula, which is a, a several rows of, of teeth, which they use to scrape the rock and remove all the al algae that, that is in the rock. You can see an experiment there. This treatment here where limpets were removed, you can, uh, there are, sorry, limpets were not removed and you can see there is no algal growth. And here, where limpets were removed, you can see there is a lot of fucoid, fucoid algae, fucus. It's um, a brown, large algae that you also get here in, in Galicia. So they are important. The problem, in the Azores, this is called, the limpets are a delicacy. So it's mar marisco. So it's, they are the most traditional dish from the Azores in terms of seafood. And... Uh, there was a very big exploitation, and then the fishery collapsed around 85. Uh, there was also a relationship, so islands, more, islands with uh, more people are, also tend to have fewer limpets. So there is evidence that there is an effect of uh, over-exploitation, too much fishing of, on this resource. So this is the start for my PhD. I started from here, and when I, okay, I know the, the fisher has collapsed, but how many limpets are there? So I went, I did a survey for both species, and I found that there was a regional scale variation. So some islands, for, for instance, Flores Island has a lot of limpets. Graciosa has very few limpets, Pico intermediate levels, San Miguel intermediate levels, four candy eye. Whereas Patel Aspera, which is the preferred species for people who eat them, is virtually extinct in most of the islands, except in Flores. So there was evidence that there is differences in the abundance of limpets among islands, which is reflected on, which is explained by the difference in population. Okay? Um, the problem, as, as I told, the, the limpets play a, uh, an important role in the ecosystem. So when you relate the, the, the cover of algae with the abundance of limpets, you see there is, that there is a negative relationship. So islands with less limpets also have a greater cover of algae. Similarly, they have a, a lower cover of barnacles. Barnacles are the species that are outcompeted by the large fucoids. Okay? So there is a, a community cascading effect of the exploitation of limpets. Uh, this is just to show you some quadrants. This is a, a quadrant with a, a very a large abundance of limpets, and especially very large ones. This is a 50 by 50 centimeters quadrant, and you can see there is no algal growing there, whereas this is a typical uh, patch of the shore without any limpets, where, where you can see that the algae is a already extending and killing all the barnacles. Um, also, when, when, when the algae grow, they, 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 they occupy space, and, and if, if you get fucus, they, they, they swipe the, the rock, so they don't allow the larvae of, of limpets to attach, to settle. 
So there is a negative effect. So in this ex another experiment that I've done, I cleared the turfs, the algae, and the, the controls where I did not clear the, the turfs. And where I see, I only, get, I only got recruitment, settlement of limpets in areas where the algae were removed. So there is a, there's a snowball effect. You remove limpets, there are more algae. And then these algae don't allow the limpets to settle. Okay, so there's a, a snowball effect. Also, I measured uh, a lot of limpets, and you can see that um, most of the individuals are very small size. You can see this is one centimeter. Most of, and this was true for the four islands that, that I examined. You can, the dashed line here is the, indicates the minimum size of collection. And as you can see, there are very, very few individuals larger than the legal um, size of exploitation. So again, another indication that these animals are being overexploited. So we are reducing the abundance and we are reducing the size. Is it the, is it the same ecologically? So to, to, te to test these, I developed an experiment where I have two large limpets and two small limpets, which I call the normal community. So you have an abundance of large and small individuals, as you would see in a natural shore. And then I exploited this, this community, but remove only the, the large ones. So I keep the density, a total of four limpets, but they are all small. And another treatment where I, where I removed the abundance, but kept the structure, the size structures. So I still have large and small, but I have a reduction in abundance. And then you can see that the, the amount grazed is, is similar between the two treatments. So reducing the abundances, the abundance of animals is having the same effect as losing the large ones. So the large ones are important, okay? Um, we have not tested this, but we know from the literature that a reduction in size also has potentially an impact on the reproductive output. So smaller animals produce less eggs, less juveniles. They, they, they contribute less to the reproductive output of the animal. Whereas large limpets, large animals, large birds, everything produce more eggs, more. So they contribute more for the sustainability of the population. Um, Okay, what about marine protected areas? These, these were shown to be very effective ways to protect, but they also are very important for scientists if you want to see what the community would look, look like without human act, uh, intervention, okay? So, in the Azores, we also have marine protected areas, and um, I went to see them. I examined two of them, and two of them, and, and, and control areas where there, there is fishing. And what I saw, at, at, and I did this work for three years, and this is pulling all the data together, so it's the average of the three years. And you can see that inside the, inside the, the marine protected areas and outside the marine protected areas, there is no difference between the two sides. There's only a difference between time. This is a winter sampling in black, and this is a summer sampling in gray. Uh, there is a recruitment during winter, which is explains this higher abundance in winter. And then in summer, then when the sea conditions are calm, uh, people tend to collect a lot of limpets, and then you can see the decrease in abundance. So there is a seasonal effect, but there is no difference between what's happening in within a marine reserve and outside. Okay, so this indicates that reserves are not working. I have the same amount of limpets of animals inside and outside. Why is that? So here we sh I have the average number of per people per day per 100 meters of shore seen. And inside, you can see, okay, it's a little bit larger with, you know, outside the reserve, but you still get some pressure inside the reserve. So there is a lot of illegal collection of animals. So that's why reserves, I think we believe that this is why Reserves are not working. People don't care. So there are reserves on paper, but they are not truly effective reserves because people still go there and collect all the animals. 
And uh, the Azores is not like the mainland Europe, okay? So the shores are very small, small space for, for, for animals, and one person can have a huge impact on the shore, okay? Here we have very extensive rocky shores, so it's, it's more easy to have, uh, it's more diluted the effect of, of people. Uh, this is to show that the community or the picture of the rocky shore in the Azores, and as you can see, there's a lot of algae growing everywhere, even up around the shore, where you, you have the barnacles, which are these white patches. You can see there is a lot of turfs growing on. <coughs> this is the, the typical situation <coughs> in the Azores that you can find. And fortunately, we have one reserve that, that is really working, we, which we which he, we sampled last year. And this is it. And you can see that above the low water tide, there's nearly no algae growing. And all these things that you can see are very large animals, very large limpets, okay? Only, the only algae you see is very close to the water, and these holes, these holes are made by the sea urchin, Paracentrotus lividus, okay? Orisu. Uh, so, again, here we have a representation of what the community would like, would uh, look like without human intervention. This is very, very important for a scientific because we have a control, a reference base to, to know, okay, this is my target. I want to reach this target. Just to say that very large crabs that are not common as well uh, elsewhere are also very abundant with, inside the reserve. So this reserve is not only protecting limpets, it's protecting the ecosystem as a whole. Okay. Um, another study that I've done was based on this observation that most of these species, Patella candii, uh, Lapa mensa, occurs within cracks, pits, Holes, so, and I said, okay, let's, let's see if this is really, why is this? So, I sampled and I saw that there was a significant association of the animals with these features of the rock. So, there were more, more animals inside holes and pits and cracks than expected by chance, according to the abundance of uh, the, the crevices and the open rock. I also found, I also, I put a little, some, some tiny tags on, on, on limpets that were inside the, the holes and those that were outside. And I followed them through, through time and I saw that the ones that were outside the holes uh, died more, more than the ones that were inside the pits. So again, this was showing that, that the holes, the pits, they, they, they confer the species some protection from predation, desiccation, and all, or even exploitation because it's more difficult to, to, to collect a limpet which is inside a hole. Um, I also found that there were the differences in the size of the animals that were inside the holes and the, one, the ones that were on open rock. And the ones that were inside the holes were smaller, okay? This indicates that these microhabitats may, may be more important for juvenile stages of the animals, not so much for the adults. <clears throat> okay, this is very interesting, but is this information of any relevance? Is, is there any conservation value for this information? What we know is that human populations tend to be concentrated on the shore, on the shoreline. And as a consequence of that, we are replacing thousands of kilometers of shoreline by urban structures. You probably have them here as well. So, sea walls made of concrete, uh, pontoons, everything, wharfs, everything. We are replacing the natural habitat by artificial habitat. And what happens is that if you, if you compare both, this is a, an, a seawall, and you see it's very, very flat, very homogeneous, whereas a, a natural rock, a rocky shore is lots of microhabitats. This is at large scale. If you look at small scale, this is concrete. 
It's very smooth, no cracks, no pits, no holes. A natural shore usually have a lot of these features, okay? So in the Azores, we also have these kind of sea walls which are made of basalt, but the rock is queried inside the island and is very flat. So you can see a picture here, there's only a few barnacles, which are these white dots here, and then there's a black rock, nothing else there. Okay, so this is a problem. What, what if, I, if I drill, if I do some holes in the seawall? What happens? That's what I've done. And I have, I've, I've drilled large holes, small holes, very abundant, uh, um, very numerous holes, few holes, and what I found was that generally there were more animals in areas where the habitat has been enhanced, where I drilled the, the holes, than in control areas. Okay? So it's showing that by drilling holes, increasing the topo topographic um, complexity of the seawall, of artificial substract, I'm increasing it's the abundance of limpets, okay? And uh, I also found that there were differences between the treatments. So for the recently recruited animals, it was more important the number of holes that are drilled. More, more holes, more animals. For the juveniles, the results were inconclusive. And for adults, what was important was the size. They were responding to the size. Of course, a large limpet cannot fit in a small hole. So they were limited by the number of large holes. So these results suggest that habitat enhancement was successful at increasing the number of limpets on these man-made structures. So we can modify them very easily to increase, to use them for conservation purpose, for instance, okay? So, also very important, there was evidence that I increased the settlement, the recruitment, which is very important if you're considering the management of a, of a, um, of a, of a fishery. You need recruitment, this, this is the important, this is the, the replacement of the population. So, you, you need measures that inc increase the recruitment. And this is just to say that there's, this is a very simple thing to do, which can be used and conciliate the, the, our need to protect the shorelines and conservation, okay? This is just to show you some pictures and where, you, where you can see clearly that the limpets are inside the holes, the large holes, the small holes, everywhere. So clear there is, they really like these, these things. Uh, okay, so th there's a big fishery about limpets, we, but we don't know if they are any good for health. Can we eat them safely? We don't know. Also, volcanoes, the Azores are volcanic islands, and still the, vo the volcanoes are still active. And volcanism is a source of natural pollution. Okay, it releases a lot of things that are nasty. Okay, is this having an impact? On, on, the, on the things that we eat. It's important to know. So we sampled two areas. This is San Miguel Island, and we sampled two areas that have shallow water uh, vents. These are, these are areas where there is natural emission of gases, of volcanic gases. So if you go there, you see bubbling from the sea, and the water is warm, okay? And we have two of these, Ferreria and Ribeira Kent, and then two control locations where there is no emissions of volcanic activity. Okay, and what we found was that there were some differences between, between the areas with volcanic activity and the ones without uh, uh, volcanic activity. One of them was the amount of calcium found on, on, the, on the animals, which is very easy to interpret because the emissions of, 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 um, of, uh, of the, um, the volcanic emissions reduce the pH of the seawater. In enclosed bays where there is activity, you can get a, a pH of six, which is very acidic compared to the normal seawater, which is around eight. So, and, and the pH destroys the calcium, okay? 
We also found differences in the amounts of manganese, I don't know how to say in English, and uh, strontium. I, I suspect Spanish should be similar. So there's an effect of, of, of volcanic activity, but none of these should have, are not limiting. What, uh, what we are concerned about for people is the amount of mercury, lead, and cadmium. And for mercury, it was okay, lead was okay, but for cadmium, we saw that it changed from place to place, but you can see that there are some places where the amount of cadmium is nearly three times more than the one that is uh, established by European Communion levels, okay? So we have more concentration of some heavy metals on animals than that one that is legal by, by European uh, laws. And cadmium is a, can have some negative effects on human health. Uh, we also found that animals that were collected in areas with a, a volcanic activity usually showed a large, a much more uh, um, nuclei, nuclei that were dead, so which is called apoptosis, okay? So there's an indication that they live in a stressful environment. This is not good for them. And we also found that in Pantelecanii, which is a gonochoric species, which means that has males and female, females separately, separately, is not hermaphroditic, we, show, we, we found more hermaphroditic animals in these areas, which is an indication that the volcanic activities are messing up with the hormones and things like that, okay? We also, we also okay, epibiosis is, is the study, or, or is not the study, is the, the is the many, many, many species use other species as a habitat, and this is called epibiosis. And usually this is a clean shell of a limpet, but usually, you never find it like this for Patel aspera. Usually, it's heavy, heavily colonized by uh, other organisms, mostly algae. And what we have done with all the animals that we collected for the project that Pablo is going to talk, we examined the shells. Okay? So, and we examined 700 animals, shells, and we found an aston astonishingly high number of species on the shells. Okay? So, you found... One, nearly 200 species of, of other of algae and animals living on the shells of the, of the limpets. Of these, 70, 17 were new species never recorded in the Azores. They are not, not new species for science, but they are new species for the Azores. Okay? Um, so we also found that there was, there was a very highly significant relationship between the size of the shell and the number of species that it supports. So the greater the number, of, the greater the shell, the larger the shell, the more species it can support. So which, overall these results suggest that limpets are also an important habitat for other species, the shells, and that especially the larger animals. Okay. Uh, we are also interested in, in, um, in the reproduction of, the, of, the, of these animals. And um, there is a PhD going on. This is, this is preliminary results. And where we are comparing the reproductive um, stages all throughout the year now. And, and we are comparing that to data that we have from the uh, 80s. So nearly 30 years ago. And this is important to see if there is an effect of climate change and, and, and stuff like that. And, and what the preliminary results are showing is that nowadays data, there is a, a lack of individuals reaching the highest level of maturation. Okay? We don't have as many uh, big and fat animals. Whereas 30 years ago, there was a clear peak in reproduction in winter. Okay? So this suggests that there's something going on that less, less animals are reproducing. Okay? 
We still need to confirm this result because this is only one year. It could have been an abnormal year. So we are repeating these two more years to see if there is a consistency in these results. But if this is true, this is showing that there is lack of reproduction going on, which could um, affect the, the sustainability of the populations. Uh, so all, all these work suggests that there is a problem with limpets and there's a problem in, in marine reserves. They are not effective because people still go, go there. But we have a lot of uh, marine reserves and, very, and only a few people to, to, to go there and, um, and supervise if they are okay. So maybe if we reduce the number of marine reserves, we have better enforcement, better, it's better. I'd rather have two reserves that work than 20 reserves that don't work, okay? Because I, I need them to work. So in order to do that, we need to know if there is connectivity among populations. And that's where we designed um, an experiment and submitted a project which is called Patel Gene, which is just look, using the genetic data to help us to identify if there is larval connectivity and at what scales, at the, what distances should I put my reserves, okay? Can I have one reserve for the entire archipelago? Or can I, do I need one reserve per island? Do I need more reserves per island? That's the kind of questions that we are concerned. Después de la interesante presentación de Gustavo, que aborda la parte ecológica y reproductiva, voy a contaros lo que hicimos de, desde el punto de vista genético. Bueno, eh, desde un punto de vista conservacionista, lo primero que tenemos que definir es qué cosa hay que conservar. Hay que acotar la unidad biológica. De lo que partimos es de, de esta estructura eh, construida con caracteres morfológicos, es decir, la taxonomía clásica, eh, que reconoce en el género patela nueve especies. Estas nueve especies solamente existen en el Mediterráneo y el Atlántico. Son especies que se han formado por especiación y diversificación en el Atlántico después del, de la apertura del mar de Tetis, eh, eh, la ruptura de Pangea hace 21 millones de años, solamente existen en el Atlántico Mediterráneo. ¿de acuerdo? Eh, hay otros eh, géneros de la familia Patelidae, pero no están distribuidos en, este, en nuestras costas. Entonces, lo que podemos eh, preguntarnos es si la morfología nos está contando toda la verdad sobre la estructura génica de estas especies, si estos genomas son íntegros o están subdivididos, si tenemos que conservar todo o parte de eso. Y como ejemplo de la incertidumbre que existe, eh, os pongo esta diapositiva de Patella candei, una de las especies distribuidas en Azores, que Weber y Hawkins en el año 2002 identifican con todos estos morfotipos. En principio dicen es la misma especie, pero es una especie que adopta todas estas formas. Vosotros diríais que es la misma especie o que no es la misma especie. Ah, en principio, morfológicamente parece que no, ¿verdad? Ah, bueno, pues ellos describen esto, proponen que puede haber subespecies, pero esto no se puede responder hasta que no se ah, aplican marcadores genéticos que nos cuenten el estatus real de estas especies. Como ejemplo de la incertidumbre que causa la morfología, tenemos estas dos formas, mosca y mansa, ¿de acuerdo? distribuidas en San Miguel y, y Santa María, en el archipiélago de las Azores. Un estudiante hace años, eh, bueno, dirigido por un grupo de investigación de allí, ah, se planteó saber si esas dos formas eran especies distintas o no. Una es de la forma intermare de la, la zona intermareal más emergente y la otra es de la, form, de la, la zona, eh, ¿cómo se dice, Gustavo? La más uh, inmersa, la, la, la submareal, perdón. ¿De acuerdo? Al aplicar marcadores alocímicos, uh, concluye que mosca y mansa son formas de patela candei gomesí y que probablemente representan la misma unidad reproductiva. Es decir, es la misma especie desde el punto de vista genético. Y por tanto, todas las variaciones morfológicas que estamos viendo son debidas al efecto del ambiente sobre un genoma plástico. ¿De acuerdo? 
Bueno, pues entonces, si eso es así, tal vez aquí haya una sola especie y haya variaciones morfológicas adaptativas de un mismo genoma a distintos ambientes. Cuando se aplican marcadores genéticos a estas formas, ya en los años a finales de los 90, se descubren cosas nuevas. Por ejemplo, oh, perdón, se descubre que, por ejemplo, lo que era Ulisiponensis, que era patela distribuida en el continente, Ahora aparece una nueva forma que es patela áspera, típica de las islas macaronésicas, y lo que era patela candei, una especie también distribuida en las macaronésicas, eh, que corresponde a la fotografía anterior, se podría subdividir en cuatro subespecies, candei gomesí, ordinaria, uh, candei candei y crenata. ¿Ah? Bueno, esas formas o subespecies se distribuyen gomesí en a, en Azores, Ordinaria en Madeira, Candey Candey en Selvagens y Crenata en las Islas Canarias. Cuando aplican los marcadores eh, alocímicos, que son marcadores proteicos pero de, de determinación genética, combinados con la morfología, concluyen que Candey de las Azores difiere de Candey de Madeira y de Canarias, con lo cual eh, aquellas formas que veíamos distintas también tienen un reflejo en el genoma. Eh, genéticamente, con alocimas también son diferentes. ¿de acuerdo? Uh, estudios posteriores aumentando el número de marcadores genéticos confirman esa existencia de distintas formas en distintas eh, islas macaronésicas. Eh, también llegan a la conclusión de que Candey Candey es la forma ancestral, Gomesí es una forma eh, relicta que habita solamente en Selvagens, y destacan dos grupos principales, Gomesí y Candey, que son estos dos de la, del punteado más oscuro, y Ordinat, Ordinaria y Crenata, formada por las que habitan Madeira y Canarias. Por tanto, lo que podemos decir es que en cada grupo, de, en cada archipiélago, habita una forma distinta de un genoma común que es el del Patela Candey, que podría tener el estatus de subespecie. Cara a la conservación genética, eh, tenemos claro que si son subespecies distintas, son genomas distintos y que habría que conservar esos genomas, independientemente los unos de los otros. Cualquier pérdida implicaría pérdida de diversidad adaptativa. ¿vale? Pero en efectos, a efectos prácticos, cada, una de estas, oh, perdón, cada uno de estos archipiélagos ah, no están gestionados por las mismas administraciones y en ocasiones no lo son por los mismos países, ¿de acuerdo? Portugal gestiona eh, eh, las islas eh, que le pertenecen como país, Canarias, eh, pues el, el Estado español, e incluso dentro de cada uno de los archipiélagos hay un propio gobierno que dicta las normas y financia proyectos y dicta las, las regulaciones de pesca. Por tanto... Eh, tenemos que descender al nivel de conservación genética de las formas específicas que existen dentro de cada uno de esos archipiélagos. ¿De acuerdo? Ah, como comprenderéis, la complejidad de la, de la gestión para la conservación ya no va a depender solamente del estatus biológico, sino que va a depender de los intereses políticos y económicos de cada uno de los archipiélagos, con lo cual eh, se complica. Eh, diseñar una política de gestión común para todos ellos. Bueno, en trabajos previos eh, al nuestro, con marcadores genéticos ya eh, apuntando a los archipiélagos concretos, a las unidades de manejo administrativo, eh, se encontró que, bueno, la, con una nova, un análisis de varianza, pues nos dice cuánta diversidad genética hay entre grupos y cuánta, eh, por ejemplo, entre el grupo 1 de... de de Azores y Canarias, tenemos una diversidad genética muy alta, un 5%, mucho mayor que entre poblaciones dentro del grupo. Bueno, eso nos está diciendo que entre esos dos grupos sí que hay una diferencia potente, que era lo que esperábamos, puesto que hay formas o subespecies diferentes. Sin embargo, dentro del grupo del archipiélago de las Azores, eh, las Islas del Norte, Flores, las Centrales y las del Sur, la divergencia entre grupos es muy pequeña, lo cual hacía apuntar a que no hay realmente una diferenciación genética dentro del pool de las Azores, que se podría considerar todo él como un solo pool génico susceptible de ser manejado en programas de conservación como una unidad de manejo. ¿vale? En Patelgin nos planteamos los siguientes objetivos. Utilizar 
muestras que sean representativas de todo el pool génico del archipiélago de las Azores, puesto que lo que se había utilizado anteriormente eran muestras reducidas. Entonces no puedes concluir cosas contundentes con muestras pequeñas. También nos planteamos utilizar marcadores microsatélites, que sabéis que son los más resolutivos dentro de especie, para estudiar un genoma y ver cómo se distribuye la diversidad de ese genoma en el espacio pero además que fuesen específicos de especie. Anteriormente se habían utilizado, pero tomados prestados de otras especies, con lo cual tienen algunos problemas técnicos y algunos artefactos. El tercer objetivo era eh, elaborar un patrón de conectividad robusto. Con robusto quiero decir establecer la direccionalidad de la conexión larvaria entre las islas, la periodicidad, si se produce en determinadas estaciones del año, y la intensidad, cuántas larvas pasan de una isla a otra. ¿De acuerdo? Si tenemos establecido ese patrón, podemos diseñar un plan de manejo eh, en función de esos datos ecogenéticos. ¿De acuerdo? Plan de manejo ajustado y adaptado al ciclo vital de esas especies. Bueno, pues el primer punto era el muestreo. El muestreo que eh, efectuaron los componentes. Aquí está yo ahí, eh, muestreando lapas. Eh, el muestreo es importante. En cada una de las nueve islas se muestrearon dos especies, patela candei y patela áspera, que son las únicas que se distribuyen uh, en este archipiélago. Uh, cada color responde a una de las dos especies y esos 105 pues, son dos muestras de 50 y una réplica. ¿vale? Con lo cual, esto se repite en todas las islas y el muestreo entonces es importante, casi mil individuos de cada una de las especies. Con este muestreo pues vamos a ser capaces de eh, concluir cosas importantes. Eh, el segundo objetivo era el estudio de eh, microsatélites como marcadores hipervariables del genoma, pero no existían y por tanto a partir del proyecto Patelgin aislamos marcadores microsatélites utilizando, bueno, pues, como sabéis, las nuevas eh, técnicas de secuenciación masiva que te permiten aislar miles de marcadores pues, en dos o tres días, ¿no? Se hacen las, las genotecas para cada una de las especies. Bueno, no os cuento detalles técnicos y al final obtenemos pues, unos 300 eh, marcadores para, para áspera y unos 100 marcadores para candey. Como punto de referencia, la gente se está, está utilizando entre 6 y 10 marcadores. Se estima que estadísticamente hay que utilizar al menos 15 marcadores, entre 10 y 20 para que no haya problemas estadísticos en cuanto a los patrones de conectividad que estableces. ¿vale? Por tanto, nosotros tenemos uh, de sobra marcadores para abordar estos estudios. Bueno, esos marcadores se multiplexan con distintos colores, cada uno, de manera que en la PCR podemos amplificarlos simultáneamente y podemos tener datos genotípicos, heterocigotos, homocigotos, heterocigotos, heterocigotos, ¿vale? de muchos marcadores en una misma migración electroforética por capilaridad. Bueno, tenemos los marcadores y vamos a aplicarlos a patela áspera. Esta es una representación del de eh, eh, número de pules génicos o de unidades génicas o de unidades de manejo desde el punto de vista genético que existiría en las nueve islas, desde Corvo hasta Santa María, en la especie patela áspera, haciendo una reconstrucción uh, bayesiana con a priori y con los datos uh, uh, genéticos. Como veis, el color implica homogeneidad genética en, toda, en todo el archipiélago. Uh, en Canarias, que tendríamos la patela candei crenata, veis como la composición del genoma ya tiene un color diferente, ¿eh? además del genoma de áspera de las, de las azores y por tanto va a ser otra subespecie y ya la especie del continente de Lisboa es patela ulisiponensis que se creía que era la misma que áspera, ¿de acuerdo? Bueno, pues estos análisis nos permiten decir, bueno, pues en principio parece que hay un solo pulgénico en todas las islas de azores. Cuando vamos a Candey, a la otra especie que se distribuye en las azores, eh, tenemos un escenario muy similar. En rojo es el genoma de Candey. En verde ya tenemos Canarias, que ya sabemos que es otra subespecie. Entonces, en principio, la integridad genética de la, estas dos especies eh, en el archipiélago de las Azores es bastante elevada. 
Desde un punto de vista conservacionista es una situación muy favorable, puesto que si tenemos una homogeneidad genética y no hay distintas unidades que conservar, con un solo plan de gestión serviría para proteger la mayoría de la diversidad de la especie. Ah. Podemos concluir entonces que las poblaciones de áspera en las Azores constituyen una metapoblación con movimiento migratorio de larvas entre las islas que homogeniza el pulgénico. Pero además, a partir de esos datos genéticos que están ahora bajo estudio, eh, también vemos que el tamaño efectivo poblacional, que es el tamaño que explica la variabilidad genética, el número de reproductores que explica esa variabilidad, es muy pequeño, está muy reducido. Como es de esperar, eh, tras décadas de sobreexplotación, y también la sobreexplotación lleva a que haya pocos individuos, hay un efecto de deriva génica y entonces los descendientes ya son parientes entre sí, con lo cual se crea una endogamia que aumenta más, uh, o sea, que disminuye más el tamaño efectivo poblacional. Bueno, eh, las cuestiones que estamos intentando eh, resolver ahora son estas. ¿Hay escalas espaciales en las que la, el flujo génico sea distinto entre islas? ¿Hay alguna isla que tenga menos flujo génico con las otras? ¿Hay zonas de alta diversidad genética dentro del archipiélago que podamos decir, oye, pues ahora estas, estas islas de esta parte van a ser los reservorios genéticos de la especie y vamos a protegerlas mientras que vamos a permitir cierto grado de explotación en las otras? ¿Cómo es el patrón de migración entre las distintas islas? ¿Es unidireccional? ¿Es multidireccional? Bueno, eh, la direccionalidad nos lo tiene que decir tanto los eh, marcadores microsatélites, puesto que con programas eh, bayesianos podemos establecer la direccionalidad de la migración, como los estudios de dispersión larvaria que eh, utilizan los ecólogos. La periodicidad, pues simplemente con réplica de los experimentos entre distintas estaciones y la intensidad también nos la dan los marcadores genéticos. Parece, según los últimos datos, que el flujo génico en esta zona de las islas centrales es muy elevado, un poco más atenuado con las Islas del Sur y más atenuado aún con las Islas de Flores, pero resulta que las Islas de Flores, como os dijo Gustavo, también tiene una mayor población era de áspera, ¿verdad? Con lo cual es la candidata a ser el reservorio natural génico de esta especie en todo el archipiélago. Si conseguimos un plan de protección de las patelas de, esta, de flores y la conectividad se produce de forma natural hacia el resto del archipiélago, siempre... Uh, podemos asegurar la persistencia de ese flujo génico y de las especies, de, de, de las dos especies de, de lapas en todo el archipiélago. Bueno, eh, el último objetivo, y ya termino, sería eh, elaborar un plan de manejo fundamentado en estos datos ecogenéticos que sea efectivo y que permita pues, que este maravilloso... Uh, eh, en clave natural de Europa, uno de los más extremos, pues siga manteniendo esas poblaciones endémicas de Candey que solo existen ahí y que se siga manteniendo el equilibrio trófico, que se impida esa proliferación brutal de algas, que se, bueno, que se mantenga la biodiversidad que vi, habita sobre las conchas de las, de las lapas, etcétera, etcétera. Pero esto va a tener que ser ya en la próxima charla porque el proyecto termina la semana próxima y como sabéis, eh, no siempre que termina el proyecto tienes todos los datos elaborados ya. ¿no? Estamos eh, ahora con, con el procesamiento de los datos y, y, y bueno, pues interpretando y viendo, poniendo sobre todo en conjunto los datos genéticos y los datos ecológicos para hacer una interpretación común. Y nada más, muchas gracias por vuestra atención. Si queréis ver eh, los resultados del proyecto, que iremos subiendo y hay cosas subidas, tenéis ahí en... Uh, en patelgym.com todos los datos. Muchas gracias. Which is explained by the difference in population. Okay. Um,
the problem. As, as I told, the, the limpets play a, uh, an important role in the ecosystem. So when you relate the, the, the cover of algae with the abundance of limpets, you see there is, that there is a negative relationship. So islands with less limpets also have a greater cover of algae. Similarly, they have a, a lower cover of barnacles. Barnacles are the species that are outcompeted by the large fucoids. Okay? So there is a, a community cascading effect of the exploitation of limpets. Uh, this is just to show you some quadrants. This is a, a quadrant with a, a very a large abundance of limpets and especially very large ones. This is a 50 by 50 centimeters quadrant. And you can see there is no algal growing there, whereas this is a typical uh, patch of the shore without any limpets, where, where you can see the ocean and then the fishery collapsed around 85. Uh, there was also relationship, so islands, more, islands with uh, more people are also tend to have fewer limpets. So there is evidence that there is an effect of uh, over-exploitation, too much fishing of, on this resource. So this is the start from my PhD. I started from here, and when I, okay, I know the, the fisher has collapsed, but how many limpets are there? So I went, I did a survey for both species, and I found that there was a regional scale variation. So some islands, for, for instance, Flores Island has a lot of limpets, Graciosa has very few limpets, Pico intermediate levels, San Miguel intermediate levels, for candy eye. Whereas Patel Aspra, which is the preferred species for people who eat them, is virtually extinct in most of the islands, except in Flores. So there was evidence that there is differences in the abundance of limpets among islands, which is reflected on algae is already extending and killing all the barnacles. Um, also, when, when, when the algae grow, they, 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 they occupy space, and, and if, if you get fucus, they, they, they swipe the, the rock, so they don't allow the larvae of, barnic, of limpets to attach, to settle. So there is a negative effect. So in this ex another experiment that I've done, I cleared the turfs, the algae, and the, the controls where I did not clear the, the turfs. And where I see, I only, get, I only got recruitment settlement of limpets in areas where the algae were removed. So there is a, there's a snowball effect. You remove limpets, there are more algae. And then these algae don't allow limpets to settle. Okay, so there's a, a snowball effect. Also, I measured uh, a lot of limpets, and you can see that um, most of the individuals are very small size. You can see this is one centimeter, most. and this was true for, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here and present some of the work we have been done in the Azores. Uh, most of the work that I'm, gonna to, I'm going to present is uh, some research that I've done for my PhD, for doctorado, and um, which led later to, the, to this project, Patel Rin, that we developed together with Pablo. And, um, so I'm presenting an overview of all the work that, that we have been doing with Patella. Okay, in the Azores, we have two species of limpets, lapas. We have one which is called Patella aspera, and in Portuguese, we call it lapa brava. And the other one is Patella candii, which we call, we call lapa mansa. Uh, they are very easily distinguished by both the shell and if you turn them around, you can see the color of the foot, which is very different. So they are very easily identified. Also, Patella canii usually is a, is a species that occurs intertidally, mostly, whereas Patella aspera occurs both intertidally, but also subtidally, so underwater. Okay? Uh, limpets are a very important species in the ecosystem because they regulate. The, the amount of algae that grows and occupies space. So they, they have this radula, which is a, a several rows of, of teeth, which they use to scrape the rock and remove all the al algae that, that is in the rock. 
You can see an experiment there. This treatment here where limpets were removed, you can, uh, there are, sorry, limpets were not removed and you can see there is no algal growth. And here where limpets were removed, you can see there is a lot of fucoid, fucoid algae, fucus. It's um, a brown large algae that you also get here in, in Galicia. So they are important. The problem in the Azores, this is called, the limpets are a delicacy. So it's mar marisco. So it's, they are the most traditional dish from the Azores in terms of seafood. And uh, there was a very big exploitation.